The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Our next speaker is Dr. Eli Ivanovich, who's Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley, where he holds the James and Catherine Lau Chair in Engineering. He's also the director of the NSF Center for Energy Efficient Electronics Science, a multi-university center based at Berkeley. He's a fellow of IEEE, the Optical Society of America, and the American Physical Society. He's a life member of Eta Kappa Nu, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences. He's been awarded the Adolf Lom Medal, the, w the W. Streifer Scientific Achievement Award, the R. W. Wood Prize, the Julius Springer Prize, and the Mountbatten Medal. He also has an honorary PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. In his photovoltaic research, Yovanovitch introduced the 4N squared light trapping factor that is used commercially in almost all high performance solar cells. Yovanovitch introduced the idea that strained semiconductor lasers could have superior performance due to reduced valence band or whole effective mass. And today, almost all semiconductor lasers use this concept, including telecommunication lasers, DVD players, and red laser pointers. Eli is regarded as one of the fathers of the photonic band gap concept and coined the term photonic crystal. And today, he's going to be telling us about the multispectral optoelectronic physics of solar cells for efficiencies greater than 30%. OK, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and to uh, follow uh, the previous speakers who have already uh, explained so much uh, that is uh, very important. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, perhaps talk about the next step uh, about how we're going to keep increasing efficiencies. Now, we heard in the question period uh, about balance of systems costs. And of course, uh, it's uh, very important uh, to think about balance of systems costs. And as the uh, panel cost comes down, which seems to be quite inevitable now, but we're seeing uh, costs that are much lower than people expected. Uh, well, if the panels uh, go down in cost, the only way the different technologies can compete is through their efficiency. So we need to think uh, about higher efficiencies. And uh, just uh, looking at the, uh, uh, where, uh, where things are right now, uh, the uh, clearly 30% uh, efficiency, it, uh, I, I hate to say this, but it almost forms a baseline. You, just to be in the game, you have to be able to talk about uh, greater than 30% efficiency. So that is actually a very big change in uh, photovoltaics. In fact, uh, there uh, was mentioned already uh, uh, the uh, new record uh, by Alta Devices for a uh, flat plate uh, thin film cell. So this is uh, uh, the world record for single junction cells. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. And uh, what it, I guess the most remarkable thing about it is that nothing had changed for almost 20 years. And just in the past uh, uh, two or three years, uh, the efficiency has gone up. And it, uh, this tremendous improvement it, it has involved some new physics, which I'll, I'll describe the new physics in a couple of slides, but uh, the entire improvement is due to a boost in voltage. Now, voltage is uh, one of the more subtle aspects of solar cells. Uh, people often talk about boosting the current, and uh, to understand that, you have to be like a good accountant, uh, keep track of where the current went. It's like money, you just watch the flows. Voltage is a little bit more uh, subtle, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, it requires a little bit of thought. I'll try to explain it as best I can. Uh, but it just shows that uh, this entire improvement, uh, breaking the record, going from 25 to close to 29% over the past uh, two or three years in a single junction cell, that has uh, come about because of the voltage boost. So um, where does voltage come from? Well, uh, uh, Harry Atwater explained to us uh, about uh, the chocolate queezer analysis, a, a brilliant thermodynamic analysis uh, that uh, told us what is the ideal open circuit voltage to expect. But implicit in this analysis, but not necessarily spelled out, is the idea that uh, in order to achieve that very, very high uh, uh, theoretical voltage, you actually have to be in a very unusual physical situation. And that is that if you're at open circuit and uh, the electrons and holes cannot go into the wires, uh, where do they go? And ideally, they would go, just come back at, at you or just come back at the sun. And so it becomes very important that under ideal conditions, uh, all of the sunlight can come back as a luminescence. And uh, that represented the ideal condition put forward by Shockley. But in practice, it's very difficult to get 
very high external uh, uh, fluorescence. And it's also very counterintuitive. How would you like it if I come and tell you that for your solar cell to perform well, you have to give back some of the light? And uh, people have rebelled against this. They say, no, why should I be giving back any of the light? I'm trying to achieve the highest possible efficiency. Nonetheless, uh, the, uh, to get the highest voltage, you do have to give back some of the light. And at open circuit, you have to give back all of the light. So it's, it's actually uh, a very counterintuitive insight. But this is exactly what led to the uh, new efficiency records uh, that I uh, just mentioned. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the landscape is roughly as follows. At least this was the situation uh, uh, t three years ago, is that we were up at 25% uh, efficiency and uh, very close to that, but in, uh, we were still quite far from the uh, theoretical limit, which was 33 and a half. And uh, we made up the difference with uh, uh, some uh, new physics, some new ideas, which are illustrated on uh, this slide. So this was the picture of a really good solar cell as, as it existed, uh, let's say, uh, three years ago, is the light would come in. You would uh, produce uh, electron hole pairs. The electron hole pairs would go their separate ways, it'd be collected. And if you do that very well, uh, you could uh, get efficiencies of around 25%. Uh, and starting uh, two or three years ago, uh, a rather different picture emerged for what is the ideal solar cell. And that is, yes, you have your uh, sunlight coming in. And, uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, produces electron hole pairs, but in a really good cell, those electron hole pairs have a very high probability of recombining radiatively. No problem. They emit a luminescent photon. Now that luminescent photon bounces around. It uh, gets absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted many, many times, and uh, finally escapes. Now, according to Schalke and Quasar, the escape is actually good. Uh, because the more uh, luminescence efficiency you have externally, uh, the, uh, that's an indication of having very low internal losses, which enables you to achieve the theoretical limits. So in this uh, new picture of solar cells, yes, you have one sun coming in, but you could easily have 30, 40, 50 suns of internal trapped luminescence. And that becomes the essential thing. And with that tremendous amount of trapped luminescence, you have a decent probability that at least some of those photons will get out. And uh, it's a very different picture of what a solar cell should be. Uh, it should have one sun coming in, but it should have trapped internally 30, 40, even 50 suns of infrared luminescence. And the recognition of this enabled the new efficiency records. Uh, the idea that you're uh, trapping light and uh, recycling it internally, it forces you to have a really good mirror. So all the recent records are not based on changing the material of the solar cell or improving the material. They're based on just making the mirror better. And uh, well, you had a 96% uh, reflectivity mirror, new record. You get a 97% uh, uh, reflectivity mirror, and you beat that record. You have another new record. 98, uh, th there's going to be another record as well. So all of these improvements are uh, an indication of improving the mirror, and also you want to have, you still do want to have the most outstanding material that has 99% uh, or better internal fluorescence yield. So this has opened up the door to higher efficiencies than what uh, people expected. And actually, this little story uh, is written up as a little news report in IEEE uh, uh, Photonic Society News this month. So you can go uh, look that up. Now. Uh, one of the questions, though, is, is that how do you get the light out? And uh, the, uh, there, there are two aspects of this. And one aspect is that you uh, have photon recycling, you know, and, and that's very good. But there's another way to get the light out, and that is by texturing the front surface. And then not only uh, do you get the light out, but you, you have a, a, an equally important benefit that we've heard about, and that is of uh, trapping the light. And so it leads to the question, what is the ideal surface texture in a thin film? that will do the best job of absorbing light and by reciprocity, therefore, it will do a great job of emitting light. Both, both are required for solar cells. And so it uh, leads then to a search, a mathematical search, for the ideal surface texture on a thin film. Surprisingly, this question has never been answered before, is what is the best way to texture a thin film to absorb the, uh, the greatest amount of light? Now, with some kind of luck, I can turn this on as an animation. So let's see if the animation works. And so uh, here we're going through a series of mathematical iterations, 
aiming toward the highest possible light trapping. And indeed, uh, when you do this, there is uh, surprisingly a spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking that occurs. And uh, this is uh, uh, somewhat uh, non-intuitive. Le uh, the, let me uh, run the uh, video again uh, one more time because I want to show where it ends up. Uh, first of all, it, it ends up with rather uh, an asymmetric landing. I guess it's shown on the uh, next slide. And uh, what you're uh, seeing here, oops, this is a little bit stronger than I was hoping for. Let's, let's go to uh, pen. Uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, the optimal shape. You have broken the symmetry. In fact, in general, uh, what we have found uh, through uh, this uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, procedure, which we call inverse design, is that you do tend to break the symmetry. You end up with odd shapes. This is not the most odd shapes. It's actually even better when the shape is, uh, uh, is, is uh, even more asymmetrical. And what is happening is that uh, this mathematical optimization is forcing you into uh, a type of photonic band structure. And, and this texture, you can imagine that texture being described by periodic boundary conditions, which are often used. Uh, in which case, you'd say, well, you end up with a two-dimensional photonic crystal. But in fact, it's pushing you up into the very high-lying bands of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, photonic crystal, where you have very uh, random uh, trajectories, random uh, bands and uh, that, in fact, uh, that is exactly uh, what nature is telling you to do. And uh, the, uh, you, you end up with a very asymmetrical symmetry breaking, which gives you uh, the, um, uh, the strongest optical absorption. Uh, so uh, that's a project that is being conducted by uh, Vidya Ganapati, who uh, is uh, part of our center. Now, uh, that's all well and good. I should mention the 28.8% record did not include the texturing. So when the texturing gets added, it, undoubtedly it'll be 29.8, which means we're effectively at 30% uh, and we need to get going above 30% now. Uh, so uh, here is an example of a 30% uh, 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 or greater than 30% solar cell that could be made based upon uh, the Alta devices technologies, which is uh, peeled and lifted off uh, gallium arsenide films uh, and uh, with a second layer of indium gallium phosphide uh, as uh, an additional uh, tandem cell, a monolithic tandem cell. There is very, very little cost in growing the added cell uh, because uh, you're growing the gallium arsenide cell anyway, so it's just as easy to add an indium gallium phosphide cell on top of that. Now, uh, lattice matched, it uh, should be possible to have a practical efficiency of around 34%. So that's getting us above uh, the 30% uh, that we uh, talked about. And in fact, uh, the latest results have come in from Alta devices and they're now uh, at 30.8% uh, uh, and uh, essentially in a, a very low cost uh, thin film uh, technology uh, where the substrate is being reused. And uh, just to show uh, what it looks like, whoops, it is jumping ahead for no reason that I can figure. Let me go back. Okay, so you've got a preview of all, my, all the upcoming slides. But uh, this is a picture, uh, not a picture, this is the actual cell itself uh, showing the flexibility and uh, uh, showing uh, how uh, adaptable it is. And so it goes along with some of the other ideas that you've heard is that uh, we're entering a stage of very high efficiency and very low cost and it's taken a long time for the field to get to this point. Uh, so in splitting the solar spectrum, uh, we, uh, well, it's well known that uh, if we can take, uh, slice and dice the solar spectrum and treat each part individually, we can do a much better job. And uh, you saw the beginnings of that with the first tandem solar cell from uh, Alta devices. Uh, so we have some strategies. How shall we do this? And I showed you the uh, tandem solar cell. Uh, which uh, basically involved uh, sunlight coming in and maybe some orange light coming in uh, or red light coming in and going into the gallium arsenide layer, into this layer. And uh, we have uh, some uh, shorter wavelengths going into the uh, gallium and the phosphide layer. And uh, well, there's some interesting effects that occur. You know, we've learned that for a very good solar cell, we have to have luminescence. So one of the interesting effects that occurs when you do this very well is the luminescent coupling between the layers. And that actually 
uh, has uh, many benefits. So uh, that's uh, one way of making a multi-junction solar cell. That is serial splitting. At first you strip off uh, the green light and then you strip off the red light and so forth. Well, there's another approach possible and that's uh, lateral splitting. So you can imagine uh, coming along uh, the surface and uh, the solar spectrum would be subdivided into the uh, different colors um, and uh, along this top surface you'd have a diffractive optical element which would redirect the sunlight uh, into uh, different uh, solar cells, each one of which is optimized for a different part of the solar spectrum. So this is serial splitting, this is lateral splitting. Uh, both of them are very viable and have uh, roles to play. Oops, it is jumping ahead again. Okay, let me do it this way. Okay, uh, so uh, what are uh, some of the, the issues that come up? Well, I showed you this slide before, but we, I, I also indicated to you that there was this voltage boost, which we'd like to have, and uh, unfortunately, if you look at the structure, you do a very good job of uh, recycling the infrared light, uh, that would be uh, coming from here because it would not get absorbed in the upper cell. But if you try to uh, reflect and recycle uh, the uh, luminescence from the upper cell, unfortunately it would just get absorbed in the lower cell. So the voltage boost only benefits the lower cell. And uh, ideally we would like to have it benefit all the different layers in a tandem cell. And the way to do that is uh, somewhat challenging in that uh, you uh, try, have to try to trap the luminescence the uh, high energy luminescence in the upper cell. And at the same time, of course, it's quite easy to trap the low energy luminescence in the lower cell. But you're trying to prevent uh, the uh, uh, big uh, luminescent photons from going into the lower cell. And the challenge is how to do that. Now, uh, you could think that, well, that, that's an interesting challenge. You want each layer of the tandem to trap its own luminescence. and um, at the same time uh, that it's trapping luminescence, it has to let the sunlight come straight through. Now, you could say, well, the luminescence is at a slight frequency shift compared uh, to the incoming sunlight, so I can use some type of spectral filter. But the luminescence is really just too close to the band edge, to the, to the incoming sunlight. And uh, so it turns out that the best way to trap luminescence and not interfere with the sunlight is based on angular selectivity rather than spectral selectivity. And the angular selectivity comes about if you have an interlayer between the uh, tandem layers of a very low index. Ideally, you'd like to have an index of one. Uh, maybe you'd make it out of air or aerogel, some low index material. And then you do a fantastic job of reflecting the internal luminescence, 98% reflectivity of the internal luminescence. At the same time, you want the sunlight to go through unperturbed uh, by the strong reflection. And uh, you do that uh, by including an anti-reflection coating. And this anti-reflection coating does not uh, penalize the total internal reflection. It coexists with the total internal reflection. So you're trying to have uh, uh, an anti-reflection coating at the same time uh, that you're having total internal reflection. And that is actually achievable. And you can actually get 99% transmission uh, through the anti-reflection coating and at the same time have 98% reflection of the luminescence that you'd like to trap. And the benefit of this then, the 98% uh, reflection and 99% transmission, is that you can extend the voltage boost that has allowed the new efficiency records, you can extend that uh, to the upper layers of a, a tandem solar cell. So that is uh, something that uh, we may see in uh, future uh, uh, tandem solar cells. Now, uh, one would like to then uh, also think about optimizing the top and bottom band gaps. And although the uh, optimal uh, bottom band gap uh, tends to be uh, around uh, one volt, uh, that's only if you imagine ideal conditions at 25 centigrade. If you allow the panel to get warm, it pushes you to a uh, slightly uh, higher band gap. And in fact, uh, I've been pushing uh, for uh, uh, band gaps around uh, two electron volts where uh, you could, uh, in, a, in a structure where uh, uh, no current matching is required, you could uh, think about perhaps approaching 40% uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, so the question is how to do that. So I'd like to describe what's involved in using lateral splitting. 
so uh, there are some issues. You say, well, you have the sunlight coming in on top, and you're going to subdivide it into a red cell, a yellow cell, and a green cell. Uh, sounds very easy, but there's a little problem you have to be very careful of. And that is, uh, the sunlight is occupying the full area of the front panel. But by the time it gets to the rear area, it, ha it occupies a smaller area. And that smaller area is, is inevitable in this type of configuration. So you have concentrated the sunlight uh, to, from big area to a somewhat smaller area. Now, any kind of concentration has to come at some kind of uh, penalty. You've got, you've got to, uh, uh, you've got to uh, put some effort into concentration because concentration ends up as free energy. And so in this case, uh, you overcome this problem by recognizing that you're going to be making uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, panel out of glass and the refractiveness of glass gives you enough focusing power. So if the rays are coming in from these angles and these angles, uh, nonetheless, they will focus down properly to a uh, smaller area just due to the refractive in exchange. And that becomes a very important part of understanding uh, lateral splitting. I don't know any other way of doing lateral splitting uh, other than by, um, uh, by uh, uh, having a uh, refractive index of this sort, uh, which allows uh, separate concentration of the different colors onto the different solar cells on the back. And uh, we heard from John Rogers how uh, the technology for, for uh, pick and place manipulation of small area solar cells, that this has become more commonplace. And in fact, uh, that type of technology is exactly what uh, would be used for uh, lateral splitting. Although it doesn't have to be that small, one can imagine uh, these stripes would actually be uh, a millimeter wide. So the cells are not that small, uh, but um, uh, we have to uh, uh, consider how we go from the big area on the front to the separate uh, solar cells on the back. Now, uh, you say, oh, fine, you can probably do that, but what, what's this holographically patterned surface that's going to redirect the different colors where they need to go? And that is a very difficult mathematical problem. How do you come up with a design for the hologram? So I'd like to show you a little bit about the mathematics that allows for these types of designs. And it has a very evocative name. It is officially called shape calculus. And it tells us how to make the shape of different types of structures for us where we'd like to have some kind of a holographic uh, texturing uh, which would uh, uh, separate uh, the colors. Now, I won't get too much into the math, but it, has, it is pretty fancy advanced applied mathematics. Uh, uses uh, the adjoint conjugate gradient method, which is an optimization method. It's a very beautiful method in that with uh, two electromagnetic uh, simulations, you get uh, the, uh, uh, the derivative of the merit function at all points in space, so it's, it's fantastic. You get a shape derivative which tells you how to change the shape on the next, uh, next iteration. Uh, so you might say, oh man, no one's ever done this. A hologram, how are you going to do that? But in fact, uh, this is something that is uh, current use in technology. And uh, it, is, uh, it, is, I wouldn't, it isn't normally called a hologram, but it is a mask that is used for printing the patterns on a uh, silicon circuit. So uh, it typically in a silicon circuit, you might want to print uh, structures like this, but it, since we're printing sub-wavelength, it's very non-obvious what should the mask be. In fact, uh, the mask or the, uh, the negative, if you want to call it that, uh, is a uh, complicated uh, pattern. You can call it a, a holographic pattern. It's utterly non-intuitive. I would uh, certainly challenge intuition to go from that design actually ends up as this exact uh, uh, integrated uh, circuit uh, uh, pattern. And so I would think you'd have to agree the design is rather non-intuitive, but yet this is done by exactly the method, that I, the mathematical method that I uh, described, uh, which is with iterations, adjoint gradients, very, very sophisticated math. Uh, now you might say, oh, you, have you written a paper on this? Well, actually you already have this in your cell phone. So uh, the companies that make DRAMs with repeating units or would make flash memory with repeating units, they put a tremendous emphasis on getting the optimal design of the mask because even every small improvement goes straight to, the, uh, to their uh, bottom line, to their bottom line profit. Uh, so uh, th uh, those companies have actually bought uh, the software from a company I started called Luminescent. Yes, this is, this is the one. And uh, so it is actually a commercial thing, but now we have um, a challenge, maybe even a greater challenge, to design the optimal 
uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, hologram which would split the solar spectrum. So I have here an example uh, of uh, what can be uh, done. And uh, uh, this is, there's essentially a hologram up on the uh, left-hand side. And, it, and what we're trying to do is separate different colors. You can see the outcome is the red colors go this way, the green colors go this way, and the blue colors go this way. So this is very much in its infancy as an optimization problem. But let me show you uh, what the iterations look like as you go through the iterations. So it starts out very, very messy with white light coming in. And finally, or very quickly, it converges on a structure where the colors are nicely separated. And you see it's pulsating because it's, uh, it, it's being optimized around an optimum. So it uh, pulsates a little bit. And if you look at the figure of merit, uh, this is how the figure of merit, which is essentially the coupling efficiency, how it grows with successive iterations. It improved very rapidly, and then it kept improving uh, more slowly uh, uh, later on. And then you say, well, what does the hologram look like? So this is the uh, pattern of the hologram. I, I think you'd have to agree it's rather non-intuitive. Uh, but as you go through the iterations, uh, that uh, you end up, uh, uh, the math essentially ends up designing a hologram. And once we have optimized the hologram for splitting the solar spectrum, that's it forever because, you, because the sun isn't changing much. And, and so uh, we're going to be dealing uh, with uh, uh, the, what, what amounts to a, a, a splitter, uh, a solar splitter that can be used uh, uh, for generations to come. So that's the, the benefit of uh, uh, solving this mathematical problem. So this is uh, just in its infancy, as I've uh, indicated to you, uh, but we're hoping for rapid progress as part of our center. So let me summarize. Uh, uh, first, I, uh, well, lastly, really, I emphasized the uh, mathematical uh, inverse design. And we do a one-time design of the holographic spectral splitter. We reproduce the hologram uh, by uh, stamping. And you, you saw examples of that in what uh, uh, John Rogers described. And then you can just stamp it out indefinitely uh, just to get exactly the uh, spectral splitting uh, that uh, you want. Uh, another uh, editorial comment is we would like to have a nice upper band gap cell because we are going to tandems. Uh, they could be side by side, but we still need an upper band gap cell. We have a uh, gallium arsenide cell, which I uh, showed you here, uh, but uh, for the upper band gap, uh, what we're currently using is not high enough. It's gallium and phosphide. Uh, we'd like to get, get an upper cell uh, closer to 2.1 volts, an upper band gap cell. Uh, another thing that has become clear, I hope, from the all morning discussions is that we do know how to manipulate uh, freestanding thin films. This is actually very revolutionary within electronics uh, that we don't have to think about rigid uh, wafers anymore. We can have thin films. We can uh, stack them side by side. Uh, we can uh, uh, mix and match them and stack them one on top of the other. So I think uh, that's become a standard part of technology. And if I could uh, be so bold as to project into the future. We're looking, uh, I mean, just to be in the game, you have to be talking 30 to 50% efficiency and at low cost. And that will be the norm uh, to be expected. So I'm very optimistic. Thank you. Uh, so one of the questions online is, why can't you just use a prism to split the light instead of these uh, holographic uh, films? Well, a prism, that's a really good suggestion. Uh, a prism uh, isn't bad, but let me go back and show you wh what some of the problems are with uh, prisms. And so I'll go back uh, to this slide. And so you see, we, we had this issue that we had a certain surface area of the incoming sunlight, but we have a smaller area. Uh, for uh, the cells. Now, if you do a prism, where are you going to find room uh, for the other cells? So suppose you have a prism and uh, the light comes in and it refracts into uh, uh, different directions. Uh, well, where are you going to find space once you start stacking them one next to the other? Uh, it becomes uh, very prohibitive. So you end up with more complicated structures. They're deeper. You end up with bulk glass, which is undesirable. But you do have uh, this kind of a problem, is you have uh, one sun 
of white light, but then you have one sun of red light, one sun of yellow light, one sun of green light. Where are you going to put all those uh, surface areas? Because uh, there just isn't any room. And for this reason, if you're talking about a low profile structure that could be low in cost, and even three millimeters of glass, you might complain that you'd, ra you'd have have, rather have the glass thinner. Uh, even in this case, uh, we have a little bit of glass, and we have a little bit of space, and we've dealt with uh, the problem of uh, uh, crowding all the different colors together. Uh, into uh, the same uh, area as the starting area. So I'm not uh, opposed to uh, prisms in principle, but you, you end up with some uh, practical and cost difficulties. But it's, uh, maybe it's a sign of where things are headed. Definitely they're headed toward spectral splitters. Use the microphone, please. Okay, uh, uh, this is a very clever and subtle question, pointing out that sunlight, even though it's coming from the sun, has some coherence. Um, uh, the, the length that you described, the 125 microns, is actually lateral coherence, and it's represented by the uh, size of the sun. So if the sun was a point source, the lateral coherence uh, would be um, uh, even wider than 125 microns. So uh, in effect, we could take into account uh, the solid angle subtended by the sun. But we have very little concentration here because we just needed to create space to separate the red, uh, the orange, and the uh, green light. So we're looking maybe at a concentration ratio of five or thereabouts. And at a concentration ratio of five, we don't worry very much uh, about the, uh, uh, the uh, angle subtended by the sun. Uh, but that angle is what gives you your 125 microns. So for the structure you optimize by using the invert design method, is this the ultimate uh, global optimum or it's a local optimum? Okay. Or we can uh, always find some better solutions? Uh, so uh, the question is, when you try to find one of these uh, holographic solutions, is it a global optimum or is it a local optimum and there might actually be a better one? Uh, so uh, the, uh, there is a danger in this type of optimization that you will miss the global optimum. And uh, you can do various things to uh, try to guarantee that there's nothing better. Uh, you back it up with some analytical work that says uh, uh, how close you are to the theoretical optimum, because in the engineering world, you just know when to stop optimizing. Uh, if, you, if you can figure out when to stop optimizing, that's as good as getting a uh, global optimum. Uh, so it, it is kind of an interesting question, and uh, I, I think that uh, it'll remain unanswered for a long time, even uh, in photonic crystals. We kind of think we know what is the optimum photonic crystal to create a band gap, but no one has ever proven that that's the global optimum. And uh, so in this way, uh, you can imagine that we could have this meeting 10 years from now. We would have solved the mathematical problem. We would have a pretty good holographic splitter, but somebody would, would raise their hand in the audience and say, I've got a better design because you haven't proven that you had a global optimum, so I can keep improving it. And you can imagine that people may keep trying to improve it uh, for uh, a very, very long time to come. Uh, so uh, it, it's rather interesting. I can tell you that this, it comes up very often in engineering, and engineering is just, uh, this, the solution is when it's good enough, then you stop, okay? And uh, you don't necessarily have to guarantee uh, that it's a global optimum. <laughs> 